Well, we're here again reading in Little Women by Louisa May Alcott here at the Caribou Public Library for our chapter book story time. I am Miss Erin and I'm so glad that you decided to join us. We are on the first half of chapter 30 today, which is titled Consequences. Mrs. Chester's fair was so very elegant and select that it was considered a great honor by the young ladies of the neighborhood to be invited to take a table, and everyone was much interested in the manner. Amy was asked, but Joe was not, which was fortunate for all parties, as her elbows were decidedly akimbo at this period of her life, and it took a good deal, a good many hard knocks to teach her how to get on easily. The haughty, uninteresting creature was let severely alone, but Amy's talent and taste were duly complimented by the offer of the art table, and she exerted herself to prepare and secure appropriate and valuable contributions to it. Everything went on smoothly until the day before the fair opened. Then there occurred one of the little skirmishes which it is almost impossible to avoid, when some five and twenty women, old and young, with all their private peaks and prejudices, try to work together. May Chester was rather jealous of Amy, because the latter was a greater favorite than herself, and just at this time several trifling circumstances occurred to increase the feeling. Amy's dainty pen and ink work entirely eclipsed May's painted vases. That was one of Thorn. Then, the all-conquering tutor had danced four times with Amy at a late party, and only once with May. That was Thorn number two. But the chief grievance that rankled in her soul and gave her an excuse for her unfriendly conduct was a rumor which some obliging gossip had whispered to her that the March girls had made fun of her at the Lambs. All the blame of this should have fallen upon Jo, for her naughty imitation had been too lifelike to escape detection, and the frolicsome Lambs had permitted the joke to escape. No hint of this had reached the culprits, however, and Amy's dismay can be imagined when the very evening before the fair, as she was putting her last touches to her pretty table, Mrs. Chester, who, of course, resented the supposed ridicule of her daughter, said in a bland tone, but with a cold look, I find, dear, that there is some feeling among the young ladies about my giving this table to anyone but my girls, as this is the most prominent, and some say the most attractive table of all, and they are the chief getters-up of this fair, it is thought best for them to take this place. I am sorry, but I know you are too sincerely interested in the cause to mind a little personal disappointment, and you shall have another table if you like." Mrs. Chester had fancied beforehand that it would be easy to deliver this little speech, but when the time came, she found it rather difficult to utter it naturally, with Amy's unsuspicious eyes looking straight at her, full of surprise and trouble. Amy felt that there was something behind this, but could not guess what, and said quietly, feeling hurt and showing that she did, "'Perhaps you had rather I took no table at all?' "'Now, my dear, don't have any ill feeling. I beg, it's merely a matter of expediency. You see, my girls will naturally take the lead, and this table is considered their proper place. I think it very appropriate to you, and feel very grateful for your efforts to make it so pretty. But we must give up our private wishes, of course, and I will see that you have a good place elsewhere. Wouldn't you like the flower table? The little girls undertook it, but they are discouraged. You could make a charming thing of it, and the flower table is always attractive, you know." "'Especially to gentlemen,' added May, with a look which enlightened Amy as to one cause of her sudden fall from, failure, from favor. She colored angrily, but took no other notice that the girlish of the girlish sarcasm and answered with unexpected amiability. It shall be as you please, Mrs. Chester. I'll give up my place here at once and attend to the flowers, if you like. You can put your own things on your own table if you prefer, began May, with a May feeling a little conscience-stricken, as she looked at the pretty racks, the painted shells, the quaint illuminations that Amy had so carefully made and so gracefully arranged. She meant it kindly, but Amy mistook her meaning and said quickly, Oh, certainly, if they're in your way. And sweeping her contributions into her apron, pell-mell, she walked off feeling that herself and her works of art had been insulted past forgiveness. Now she's mad. Oh, dear, I wish I hadn't asked you to speak, Mama," said May, looking disconsolately at the empty spaces on her table. Girls' quarrels are soon over, returned her mother, 
feeling a trifle ashamed of her own part of this one, as well she might. The little girls hailed Amy and her treasures with delight, which, which cordial reception somewhat soothed her perturbed spirit, and she fell to work, determined to, successful, or to succeed florally, if she could not artistically. But everything seemed against her. It was late, and she was tired. Everyone was too busy with their own affairs to help her, and the little girls were only hindrances, for the deers fussed and chattered like so many magpies, making a great deal of confusion in their artless efforts to preserve the most perfect order. The evergreen arch wouldn't stay firm after she got it up, but wiggled and threatened to tumble down on her head when the hanging baskets were filled. Her best tile got a splash of water, which got left a sepia tear on the cupid's cheek. She bruised her hands with hammering and got cold working in a draught, which last affliction filled her with apprehensions for the tomorrow. Any girl reader who has suffered like afflictions will sympathize with poor Amy and wish her well throughout with her task. There was great indignation at home when she told her story that evening. Her mother said it was a shame, but told her that she had done right. Beth declared she wouldn't go to the old fair at all, and Joe demanded why she didn't take all of her pretty things and leave those mean people to get on without her. Because they are mean is no reason why I should be. I hate such things, and I, though I think I have a right to be hurt, I don't intend to show it. They will feel that more than angry speeches or huffy actions, won't they, Marmy? That is right, spirit. That's the right spirit, my dear. A kiss for a blow is always best, though it's not always very easy to give, said her mother, with the air of one who had learned the difference between preaching and practicing. In spite of various very natural temptations to resent and retaliate, Amy adhered to her resolution all the next day, bent on conquering her enemy by kindness. She began well, thanks to a silent reminder that came to her unexpectedly, but most opportunely. As she arranged her table that morning while the little girls were up in an anteroom filling the baskets, she took up her pet production, a little book, the antique cover of which her father had found among his treasures, and in which, on leaves of vellum, she had beautifully illuminated different texts. As she turned the pages, rich in dainty devices, with very pardonable pride, her eye fell upon one verse that made her stop and think. Framed in a brilliant scrollwork of scarlet, blue, and gold, with little spirits of goodwill helping one another up and down among the thorns and flowers, were the words, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I ought, but I don't, thought Amy, as her eye went from the bright page to May's discontented face behind the big vases that could not hide the vacancies that her pretty work had once filled. Amy stood a minute, turning the leaves in her hand, reading on each some sweet rebuke for all heart-burnings and uncharitableness of spirit. Many wise and true sermons are preached us every day by unconscious ministers in street, school, office, or home. Even a fair table may become a pulpit, if it can offer the good and helpful words which are never out of season. Amy's conscious pre conscience preached her a little sermon from that text, then and there, and she did what many of us don't always do, took the sermon to heart, and straight away put it to practice. A group of girls were standing about May's table, admiring the pretty things and talking over the change of saleswoman. They dropped their voices, but Amy knew they were speaking of her, hearing one side of the story and judging accordingly. It was not pleasant, but a better spirit had come over her, and presently a chance offered for proving it. She heard May say sorrowfully, It's too bad, for there is no time to make other things, and I don't want to fill it up with odds and ends. The table was just complete then. Now it's spoiled. I dare say she'd put them back if you asked her, suggested someone. How could I, after all the fuss, began May. But she did not finish, <clears throat> for Amy's voice came across the hall, saying pleasantly, You may have them, and welcome, without asking if you want them. I was just thinking I'd offer to put them back, for they belong to your table rather than mine. Here they are. Please take them and forgive me if I was hasty in carrying them away last night. As she spoke, Amy returned her contribution with a nod and a smile, and hurried away again, feeling that it was easier to do a friendly thing than it was to stay and be thanked for it. Now, I call that lovely of her, don't you? cried one girl. 
May's answer was inaudible, but another young lady, whose temper was evidently a little soured by making lemonade, <laughs> added, with a disagreeable laugh, very lovely, for she knew she wouldn't sell them at her own table. Now, that was hard. When we make little sacrifices, we like to have them appreciated, at least. And for a minute, Amy was sorry she had done it, feeling that virtue was not always its own reward. But it is, as she presently discovered. For her spirits began to rise, and her table to blossom under her skillful hands. The girls were very kind, and that one little act seemed to have cleared the atmosphere amazingly. It was a very long day, and a hard one to Amy, as she sat beside or behind her table quite alone, for the little girls deserted her very soon. Few cared to buy flowers in summer, and her bouquets began to droop long before night. The art table was the most attractive in the room. There was a crowd about it all day long, and the tenders were constantly flying to and fro with important faces and rattling money boxes. Often Amy looked wistfully across, longing to be there, where she felt at home and happy, instead of in a corner with nothing to do. It might seem no hardship to some of us, but to a pretty blithe young girl it was not only tedious but very trying, and the thought of being found there in the evening by her family and Laurie and his friends made it real martyrdom. She did not go home until night. Then she looked so pale and quiet that they knew the day had been a hard one though she made no complaint, and did not even tell what she had done. Her mother gave her an extra cordial cup of tea. Beth helped her dress and made a charming little wreath for her hair, while Jo astonished her family by getting herself up with unusual care and hinting darkly that the tables were, not, were about to be turned. Don't do anything rude, prayed Jo. I won't have any fuss made. So let it all pass and behave yourself, begged Amy as she departed early, hoping to find a reinforcement of flowers to refresh her poor little table. I merely intend to make myself entrancingly agreeable to everyone I know and to keep them in your corner as long as possible. Teddy and his boys will lend a hand and we'll have a good time yet, returned Jo, leaning over the gate to watch for Laurie. Presently, the familiar tramp was heard in the dusk and she ran out to meet him. Is that my boy? As sure as this is my girl. And Laurie tucked her hand under his arm with the air of a man whose every wish was gratified. Oh, Teddy, such doings! And Joe told Amy's wrongs with sisterly zeal. A flock of our fellows are going to drive over by and by, and I'll be hanged if we don't make them buy every flower she's got and camp down before her table afterward, said Laurie, espousing her cause with warmth. <laughs> the flowers are not at all nice, Amy says, and the fresh ones may not arrive in time. I don't wish to be unjust or suspicious, but I shouldn't wonder if they never came at all. When people do one mean thing, they're very likely to do another, observed Jo in a disgusted tone. Hmm. So we'll have to see next time if that is what happens or not. <laughs> That's the end of our reading for today, but we'll continue on next time. We'll see you then.